in time. I just wanted to turn my... <laughs> hey everybody, it's Shelly Hoffman and I'm here with Chief Mike Lefacek and um, we were just doing some technical flipping around so we uh, I lost him for a second but he's back. So how you been Chief? It's been oh, not quite a month, about three weeks maybe instead or two weeks, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, a couple, three weeks has been actually. <laughs> Good. Um, so I don't know if, if we've ever said it here, but um, the chief and I were talking about the band. So I told him I finally I'm getting serenaded by the, the drum set or the the drum line, I guess. So it was nice to hear the kids out in the parking lot the other night and they sound great. And I hope they continue to get out there and play. But um, but you were the first one to mention to me that I'd be hearing that it, it took quite a few months to get past COVID. Yes. <laughs> but there. I've had uh, two of my children are, are marching band uh, graduates and uh uh, Casey Vanderstyle does it does a great job with the band and uh, living where you do. I knew that uh, you would be uh, be become a fan of the marching band because you would have to because you're going to listen to them uh, when when they're practicing. But uh, those 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 kids, those young people, they work very very hard and uh, they put in a lot of time and effort, just like uh, any of the other programs in Baldwinsville. But uh, uh, certainly, uh, with two of my four kids having having been involved in the marching band. Uh, uh, I enjoy uh, enjoy that quite a bit, and I figured you would as well. I, I do. It, it was it was nice. Like I said, I was waiting for it to come, and finally the um, the other night uh, I was in my kitchen doing something, and I started hearing them practice. So um, I told you one night I'll record it and send it to you, so that you can you get a little bit of enjoyment out of it. As there well. we go. All right, great. I do enjoy that drum line. One of my one of my one of my sons was on the drum line, played snare drum for four or five years. So uh, so wow. I, I enjoy listening to them. Cool. So, so what's been going on in the village since we talked? Um, you know, we, we, we continue to handle our, our what we refer to as as routine calls. And, you know, one, one thing that, that, that kind of struck me is before we, we got going and, and you and I were, were talking about what's been happening. And as I was looking at my list that uh, one of the officers prepares for me every month, you know, I look at these is okay we handled this many uh, domestic disputes and this many ambulance calls or or this many calls involving individuals in some sort of mental health crisis or as i look at we had a number of uh, disputes that we handled um so for us you know these are routine these are routine calls but i suppose for the individuals involved um those days are anything but routine in their yes. life and oftentimes we're seeing people probably not at their best and probably some days that maybe they wish they had a chance to maybe do some things over, um, whether they've gotten in trouble, whether they're involved in an argument with their spouse or significant other, um, maybe they're driving in a reckless manner or driving too fast and we stop them or they go through a stop sign or, you know, they're, they're, they're involved with a, some sort of mental health crisis. And, you know, sometimes uh, we have to, as, as police officers and as a police department, take a step back and reinforce that, you know, we're really dealing with people, you know, in some cases, this might be the worst day that, that they're going to experience or, or, or close to it, other than maybe a, a death of a family member or loved one. But as far as their personal, um, you know, life goes, having to deal with the police department or police officers. So what I refer to is, you know, these are our routine calls because for us, they, they do become routine. We deal with these things uh, every day, as, as I said last time, we're averaging between a domestic and a mental health call, uh, one of those a day. So, I mean, our staff are over, you, you average that out over the course of a, of, of a year that's 365 times, 370 times, whatever it is that we're dealing with those calls. And for us, they do become somewhat routine and, and, uh, and, you know, we, we kind of understand how to, how to handle those things. And oftentimes they're with the same individuals, but then there's other occasions where, there's different people that, you know, we've never dealt with before that for whatever reason, circumstances in their life have created this situation that's in, that's required some, some intervention and, and police have been called for by whomever, maybe a neighbor, maybe by one of the participants. And so for us, that's an opportunity to, to try and handle uh, that call with as much compassion, as much uh, community service mindedness as, as we possibly can. And what I mean by that, when I talk about community service policing for us, um, in, in, in procedural justice is a big hot topic out there. Now that you hear a lot of people talking about with police departments, um, for us, you know, I look at that as, is an opportunity for us to hopefully go to that residence or that location, 
uh, uh, talk to and, and, and deal with those individuals that are there. And, and our goal is to never see them again. Our goal is to resolve that issue so we never have to deal with them again. It's not always possible. It doesn't always happen that way. But that's our goal when, whenever we go to a, a service call. We look at those as, as, as what type of customer service can we provide so they don't have to come back. Um, so whenever you, you know, and, and that kind of dawned on me in between our technical difficulties and you starting to talk to me as to something that was a little bit unique in, in, in our line of work. Yeah. Well, and, and that's true, you know, um, and I know that the mental health that kind of increased over COVID and stuff. So it was probably people that never really had that problem before. Right. Yeah. Um, and it's okay. not, you know, a little side funny story. Somebody told me this weekend was they had uh, a smoke detector issue and they finally they didn't know what else to do. So they called and that uh, fire truck showed up, the police showed up the, and she was mortified because she didn't need all that. She just needed someone to show her this, you know, first time home buyer. Um, and she's like, I don't ever want to see these people again. And I said, but it's good that they came, right? It's better than, you know, you having an actual problem and nobody showing up. But um, yeah. she yeah. was like, you know, sweating and running, getting ladders, trying to figure out what was going on. And finally, she just called for help. And she said, everybody, <laughs> everybody came. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not surprised because, you know, the 911 center, they're going to put that out there. They don't really know what's going on. And it sounded like the homeowner had a little confusion as to what was happening. So do we have a smoke detector issue? Do we have a CO2 issue? Um, you know, it's unknown as is how that's going to go out to us. So um, the, we're, we're going to get dispatched. And, and many people don't realize that uh, our police department, our officers, we respond on any fire call in the village. Um, Pre-COVID, we were going on every single ambulance call in the village. Uh, you and I have talked about this before, but I'll reiterate it. We did modify our response for uh, ambulance calls in the village. So we're not going on what we refer to as general illness calls. Someone that's just sick or maybe has the flu or is feeling under the weather. Uh, we're not going to those calls because our goal is not to expose our officers to individuals that are sick or, or maybe they have the coronavirus and people don't realize it yet. They haven't tested positive. But uh, if we get a call that uh, someone's having difficulty breathing or it's a heart attack or uh, choking or it's a full arrest, excuse me, those calls we are immediately responding to. And we're going because our officers have uh, defibrillators in their cars. They have first aid kits where they have some training. Uh, they're certainly not to the level of, of the ambulance corps. And uh, the Greater Ballinsville Ambulance Corps, GBAC, is just a wonderful, mm -hmm. wonderful uh, organization. And they do a great job. Uh, Jim Hogan and his crew down there. I can't say enough about them. But, uh, you know, our officers, because we're on patrol, uh, oftentimes we're the first ones there. So on those critical calls, our officers are still responding. Also, uh, there's a number of senior citizen apartment complexes in the village. We have master keys for those locations. So oftentimes if, uh, if the ambulance is dispatched to maybe someplace in Conifer Village or St. Mary's Apartments, uh, we have the keys to get into all those places. So our officers are going on those calls to ensure that the ambulance and the fire department can get in. And then we'll stage outside if it's not uh, an emergent type matter, if it's a general illness or something along those lines, um, we will uh, we'll just stage and, and ensure that they don't need us at all. So so that's how we're handling those. But no, I, I'm not surprised at all that uh, that the cavalry arrived as it were, <laughs> and, uh, and that there were lots and lots of lights and sirens. And uh, I'm, I'm sure her new neighbors are wondering who who moved in here. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely love her. I could just envision, you know, when that happened, she's telling the story and we were laughing, but, um, but that was literally just this weekend. I heard that story. Um, so I also, uh, you mentioned everybody should be, is wearing something with pink on it for this month as well. Correct. Yes. Yes. Uh, our officers, uh, uh, we've got, uh, some pink, uh, pink name tags, uh, that, that our officers are wearing in recognition of, uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and and really just trying to help and spread the message, uh, not only with breast cancer, but uh, but all forms of cancer that are out there that uh, people are dealing with, and and uh, certainly our our thoughts are with them, and and uh, we just felt that that was something that uh, we could do that was uh, help raise awareness a little bit. So if you see an officer and they've got uh, uh, the pink name tags on, uh, our plan is next year to have uh, uh, some more items in pink. You'll 
you might notice that our officers, uh, many of them now uh, are wearing uh, uh, an outer vest carrier with their, uh, with their ballistic vest. And it says police on the front and back. Hopefully next year we'll have uh, police uh, in, in done in, in pink as well for the month of October. But uh, uh, we received a grant from, from PERMA, our liability insurance carrier and workers comp, uh, to uh, assist us in providing these uh, outer vest carriers for our officers. And what those have done is allowed us to move some of the items from the gun belt. So our portable radio, uh, and some other items that we can take from the, 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 the waistline of the officers and put it up onto the, uh, the, their uh, outer vest carrier, well, that, where that can be supported by their chest and their shoulders and, and uh, uh, get that off the waist because uh, over time, if you think about it, you start putting a gun and uh, ammunition and a taser and a radio and handcuffs and, and all the things that we carry uh, it adds about 20 or 25 pounds to, to somebody's waistline. And uh, um, we've got a couple officers that are, that are quite thin and, and they don't even have the waistline to, to put all that equipment on, quite frankly. So um, I wish I had that problem, but I don't. But uh, um, so we're, we're doing that to, as, as far as uh, officer health wellness is, uh, is for us. And, and again, we we're very glad to, to receive a grant from PERMA to, to defray some of that cost. So, um, so yeah, if you see the officers out there and again, next year, hopefully we'll have a lot more pink uh, on the uniform. We just got these vest uh, carriers uh, within the last couple of months. So those are new to us. And, uh, but at least we got some name tags and, and our hope is that uh, we'll have some other things uh, next year as well. There's a, um, you know, it's all across, I'm sure, you know, the country, but I've noticed here in Baldwinsville, there's some men that are um, raising money, real men wear pink. So they'll have a pink tie or a pink jacket or pink. So it's nice to see, and it's nice to know what the pink is for, you know, if you weren't aware of the the um, the Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So yeah. I'll have to look. I see uh, quite a few of your officers driving driving past every once in a while. Uh, speaking though, how are, how's the school going? You know, I know we have someone new at Baker. I know, you know, wasn't really on our list to talk about, but since she mentioned it, um, I was just kind of curious how that's going this year. Yeah, the school's going uh, going very well. Uh, for those folks out there that, that maybe weren't aware, our longtime school resource officer, Officer Marty Knoll, uh, he retired after 28 years of service to the village uh, over the summer. And uh, uh, so uh, we have a new officer at Baker High School, Officer Jenna Quattrini. Uh, she's up at the high school, and uh, I, I talk to Jenna just about every day when she comes back. Uh, she starts the day early in the morning at 6.30, and uh, she's up to the school early uh, so she can be there as students are arriving. And uh, she, she's come back, and uh, she enjoys it there. She said it's going well. Obviously, uh, there's a lot of a lot of new things this year with the school with, with, with the whole COVID and the restrictions there and the, the, the different days that the kids are – in school, not in school, as you know, Shelly, uh, being a parent yourself. So it's it's really a unique time period at the school and maybe not the best situation for her to build relationships with the kids and, and be able to meet with them and interact with them only because that, that's been, been limited so much by the circumstances we're all in. But uh, from everything so far, uh, she's enjoying it a great deal and, and, and that's going well. And then at Durgy Junior High School, there was a a longtime deputy there, Deputy Mike Nord from the Anadar County Sheriff's Office. And Deputy Nord, he also retired over the summer. And uh, Officer Andrea Natoli, who's been a school resource officer for us for a couple of years at, at Van Buren Elementary School, she's going to transition to uh, to Durgy. But right now, as I mentioned, I think maybe last time or a month before, uh, she's pregnant. She's due uh, coming up here pretty quick. Uh, I've got a few dates selected on our baby pool here at the police department. So I told her she can, you know, not, 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 uh, not, not give birth until then. And on those days, I'm going to have her doing some push ups and burpees and things to, to get things moving along. But uh, of course, I was laughing, but uh, she's uh, sorry she's here this morning, but she's due coming up here in another week or two. But uh, um, she's going to, when she comes back uh, from her maternity leave, she'll be, uh, she'll be going to Durgy right now, Sergeant Chrissy Allen is up there at Durgy, and uh, obviously Durgy was closed for a little bit, so she transitioned over to Baker to assist there as well. So, uh, so far, it's been going very, very well. Um, for those folks that maybe don't realize, we've had a school resource officer program, formalized one, here in Baldwinsville for 20 years. 
Wow. We, we started in the year 2000. John Ballone was the chief. Uh, he left uh, the department in 2000, and we were getting the program going then. And prior to that, uh, even back when, when I was hired, in, in, I was hired in 1987, and we had an officer, Officer Ann Vertries, who was uh, working for us. Ann had, had been a full-time officer, had been injured in a line of duty, and she was working in a part-time capacity stationed at the school for a couple of days a week, really doing some school resource officer things. We didn't really call her a school resource officer, but really that's what she was. So we've really had this program going back into the 80s in our relationship with the Baldwinsville School District. And, you know, that's obviously many different police chiefs, many different school superintendents, and that this relationship with the, with the Baldwinsville schools and the, and the school community uh, with our police department has been a very, very lengthy one, and one that I think is a model for uh, districts and agencies across the state. I really do, because, um, you know, we've got, and then there's a sheriff's deputy, Deputy Katie Kruger, who's at, who's at Ray Middle School, and previously she was at Eldon Elementary. So really all three schools uh, of our primary schools have new new school resource officers at them this year. Um, so it's been a lot of changes there uh, with the district, but there aren't too many districts that I'm aware of, uh, none that I know of, quite frankly, that have multiple agencies supply their school resource officers. Normally it's just one agency supply all the SROs, but uh, there's no turf battles with us in the sheriff's office. Everything is, is handled very well and seamlessly. We work very cooperatively together. And uh, I think it's really a model program for, uh, for what we're able to accomplish. Nice. Well, and we only ever hear wonderful things about the resource officers, whether it's from my kids, other parents. So, um, you know, not that they're there for a lot of different reasons, but just to have that friendly face, you see them out in the community, you see the officers, uh, you know, wave at the kids, there's that recognition it's the the connection of school and community again. So I think from a mom standpoint, that's that's a pretty cool thing to have. Yeah, and, and for us, um, you know, I, I know that there's been a myth sometimes or maybe a perception because I, I believe in some school districts, this has been the case where the school resource officers um, over time sometimes develop into that disciplinarian role where they end up handling school discipline for maybe a myriad of reasons, whatever those reasons are, that that becomes uh, the, the case in some locations. That has not, nor has it ever been the case here in Baldwinsville. Our school resource officers are really exactly that. They are, they provide a resource to the students. Uh, their goal is to problem solve. Their goal is to um, uh, uh, solve problems before they, they, they start up. Maybe they become aware of two kids that are maybe having some issues with each other and that the, this issue might end up becoming physical at some point in time, whether it's in school or out of school. It's always, you know, whether it's something happens on the weekend in one of the parks in the village or it happens in school, inevitably it flows back into school because they're there for six or seven hours a day. So if our officers can, can get that information uh, either through other kids or through the school, sit down, do some conflict resolution with them, and then handle that handle that in that fashion. That way they're not involved in school discipline, they're preventing problems. And I think if you go back and look at our Facebook page and our post back in at the end of July when Officer Nall retired, and you look at the number of kids, that they're not kids anymore because some of them, because Marty was there for 12, 13 years. So, mm -hmm. you know, some of these, some of these students are, you know, pushing 30 now. And, um, you know, the comments that they had about, oh, what a great guy he was, or he helped me so much. And I mean, it was really heartfelt and they wished Marty nothing but the best in his life and wanted him to enjoy his retirement and, and, and be well. And I think when you look at the, the sum and substance and the number of those, you know, when you start talking about, okay, anecdotally, is your program a successful one? And how can you measure that? Well, quite frankly, that's going to be one of the first things I'm going to do is look at that and pull that up and say, you, let's talk to some of these kids. Let's talk to some of these young people that are in maybe their 20s now that maybe um, Officer Nall was dealing with them when they were in high school. And maybe they were, you know, 
one of those students that maybe wasn't involved in the marching band or wasn't involved in some of the activities that the school district has to offer. And he was able to forge a connection with them and, uh, and encourage them. And, um, you know, it, it's a story. Um, and maybe I told you this, or maybe I didn't. I had a, I had a young person maybe three, four months ago, right in the heart of COVID, um, come to the police department and he showed up and he said, chief, I've got, uh, 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 Dunkin' Donuts gift card I want, want you to have and, and get the get everybody, uh, you know, something to drink, some coffee at your next meeting or something on me. And he said, uh, you know, I, I, he, he was very respectful. He had just gotten out of the military and uh, he mentioned one of the school resource officers that had been, been involved a few years ago, who's retired now. And he said, you know, she was a, she did, uh, did a lot for me and uh, really encouraged me and uh, I mentioned another teacher's name. And so when, when uh, he and I got done chatting, and we talked for 15, 20 minutes, and uh, he lives here in the village, and he said, you know, I bought a house here. Just want to let you know I've come back, and it meant a lot to me. I appreciate everything that those officers did and fully support, you know, the police department and your mission. And uh, I called the officer, and she goes, oh, I, I remember him, absolutely. And she goes, geez, he wasn't a bad kid. I said, no. So he didn't he said, geez, he couldn't have been more respectful, but I guess you encouraged him to look maybe into the military college wasn't something he wanted to do. She goes, no, I did. And, and I called the other teacher who I happen to know. I happen to be personal friends with that teacher as well. And uh, called the teacher. I said, you remember this kid? And the teacher, he said, yeah, I sure do. And, and I said, well, just want you to know this happened. And I guess he's doing pretty good. And so, you know, our goal has always been for that SRO to really try and forge relationships with the with those students and uh, to be a problem solver, not a disciplinarian. That's not the role. That's why they've got principals, assistant principals. That school discipline is 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 school. Um, obviously, if there's a criminal incident that we've got to investigate or take some enforcement action on, we will do that. But those those are few and far between. It does happen, but I think by um, Officer Nall, especially his presence up there and some of the th things we were able to institute, uh, the larcenies that we used to have. When I first started as a policeman here in Baltimore, so I would go to the school once a day on a larceny call. Something was stolen out of a locker, mm -hmm. out of the gym. And the larcenies, while they might occur a little bit, provided the kids do what the staff asked them to do, lock things up, secure them. There's no iPhones and things being stolen too much because um, it does happen occasionally, but most of that is what I would refer to as user error. Uh, yeah. they're, not, they're not doing what they're supposed to do with those things. Well, since we're on the topic, would you like to say your monthly monthly statement that you've said every month for like the last three months? When you, you mentioned when locking up, keeping the lockers locked, it made me smile because you haven't said it yet, but it makes sense and we need to do it. So <laughs> We do. And again, and, and as, as Shelly said, just about every month, I know myself or the mayor, just please, please, please lock your car doors. Um, you know, if you're in your home, I, I encourage you to lock your, your home as well, um, just because we can't control what, what people are, are, are doing out there who might come to our community that's not a resident of our community that um, isn't, isn't looking to follow the law. So please lock your car doors. If you can lock your car doors, we'll greatly reduce the number of larcenies we have, which is our most, most common uh, uh, part one and part two crime on our uniform crime reports is, is larcenies. Um, for most municipalities, it is. And if we can reduce those, uh, that'll help. Baldwin's will maintain its listing as, you know, really one of the safest communities in within New York State to, to reside. Yeah. So we would we would appreciate that a great deal, a great deal. So perfect. I um I the other thing that we kind of talked about a little bit before we started today was just uh, COVID ha doesn't have as much of an impact um, on our conversations, but there's still a couple of things that come up every once in a while, right? Yeah, there are, and you know, I think it's maybe back in the forefront now with obviously President Trump and a number of elected individuals that have tested positive. And uh, uh, there's certain areas downstate that I know there's been some hot spots. And uh, uh, the governor has been, Governor Cuomo obviously has commented on those and and things. And I know flu season is, is, is coming up. Uh, I just got a flu shot last week. So those types of things are going to be happening. So we, we still do get some calls from, from people about you know, so and so is outside and they're not wearing a mask, or this this behavior is is, is undergoing. So just keep in mind that 
you know, the mask initiative is really one that if you can't socially distance, if you can't be six, six feet or more from someone, you should have a mask on. And we're getting some calls from some individuals. You know, I know someone called one time because uh, at one of the local grocery stores, there was a, a young person out collecting carts and that person didn't have a mask on. Well, from once our person talked to the caller, there was no one else out there. Like, you know, they weren't within 50 feet of anyone. And so our officer explained, geez, they're, they're nowhere near anyone. That's not, that's not a requirement of that. And I think sometimes there's a, um, there's an expectation that we as the police, if someone calls, are going to show up and, and shut someone down. And we have not had what I would refer to as blatant violations by, you know, you hear about, and I read on online about, uh, bars or restaurants that have had blatant violations where they've uh, allowed uh, maskless customers to gather and not serve them food and and uh, not enforce social distancing uh, guidelines. We have not had any of that with uh, any of our locations in Baldwinsville. I think for the most part, everyone's uh, been, a, been a pretty good steward of that. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, different for, for medical facilities and depending as to what medical facility they, they, those services they might offer, whether it's required or recommended. So we've had to do some, some education with some callers on that because some people have been a little, a little frustrated with us. Am I back? You're back. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I was getting a call, so I was afraid I was gonna, gonna lose you. So. For us, we, we still get some calls on that. Um, and, and I know some people might be surprised just to hear that because it's been so frequent and so long, um, you know, that's been kind of ingrained in us now to make sure you have your mask and wear your mask. And, um, you know, and, and, and we still hear even in the police department, I've got tape on the floor at my office door that's about seven or eight feet from where I sit. And same thing in my lieutenant's office. And, and, uh, We've got some plexiglass up for our people that work up front, even though they're about eight or 10 feet apart. We make sure that uh, we've still got a, a barrier for, for one of the people that sits up there. And, uh, you know, we're doing everything we can uh, to, to be safe. And obviously, if there's violations or people have a question, you, you pick up the phone and call us and, and we'll, uh, we'll deal with that. And uh, we don't want to see anyone get sick unnecessarily as well uh, because someone isn't wearing a mask. But. Um, we don't get too many of those calls, but they're still out there. So uh, when I was talking to uh, our staff today and said, what are, the, what are some of the things in, in last week that we're getting calls on? Um, that came up. So they asked if, uh, if I could uh, touch on that subject. Okay. Um, and, and, you know, being out in the community a lot like I am, obviously, for the most part, I see people wearing masks. I've gone into like a couple of the restaurants in the village, Angry Garlic, Sammy Malone's. And if somebody stands up to maybe use the restroom or something and they don't have, you know, they don't pull it up or they, you know, they forget for a second. Sometimes it's just a matter of someone looking at you right now. Like someone looks and then you're like, you're startled and you put it on. I don't right. think, I, I haven't seen intentionally where somebody's coming in point blank saying, I refuse. It's more or less of, you know, putting it on, like standing up to do something to, to get something and remembering to put it up. But anytime I've ever seen it, um, where somebody has forgotten myself included one time I, you know, I sat up from my chair. It took me like 30 seconds to put the mask on cause I was still talking. I know that's shocking that I might've still been talking chief, but, but I hurried up and I put it on as soon as I realized, you know, cause you don't want yeah. to be uncomfortable around you, but, right. but, that, but that's good. And, and there are people probably with, um, higher risks that might be more sensitive to it than, than I might be. And it makes sense. Or they have an elderly parent that lives with them. So they want to make sure they don't bring anything home. So. You yeah. Know. And, and I think, you know, there, there was that initial vigilance and, you know, we saw that, you know, for the first month or two, you know, the, the amount of even just cars on the roadway was so greatly diminished, especially once school closed. Um, you know, there weren't many cars out and about at all. Everyone mm -hmm. was in their homes and I think over the summertime and people have, some people have traveled and, and people have done things and those, those types of things went on. Uh, sometimes you, you lose your, your guard. Obviously we've been kind of fortunate upstate a little bit. We have not had nearly the number of cases that our, our downstate neighbors have had to deal with. So in some cases you might, you know, lose, lose track a little bit, but I think with winter approaching and uh, we just need to be as vigilant as we can with, with, with that process. So, mm -hmm. so we can stay as, as safe as possible. No, I agree. Especially with the kids back in school, you know, yeah. bring it yeah, back. That's, 
you know, and, and, and uh, that's, that's just, uh, you know, the logistics involved with even just getting the kids to and from school is, is really something. So I give the school district uh, and their team a, a, a great deal of uh, credit there. Mm -hmm, I agree. Well, is there anything else that you had on your list that you wanted to mention before we um, call call an end to this month's chat? No, obviously, if we've got to, if anyone uh, out there might have any questions at all, feel free to uh, send them in via our Facebook page. If it's something that uh, needs an immediate response, we might uh, uh, we'll try and get that uh, uh, to you as quickly as we can. But we might save that question and then use it uh, in this form as well, or send it to uh, to Shelley through the. Uh, Home hearth and community uh, process, and uh, we'd be happy to uh, to answer those questions uh, uh, in this form. So a lot of people have a chance to uh, to hear what we have to say. Uh, as always, Shelley, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you and the community. Um, I think it's a great thing. Actually, there is one more thing I'll talk about a little bit, and I've mentioned it at the board meeting, and maybe some of our residents have heard about it. Is uh, and I might have mentioned this already that uh, Governor Cuomo has issued uh, an executive order requiring that all municipalities kind of re-examine their police department, see what they're doing, uh, determine the needs for their community, and uh, look at the policies and procedures and training that those officers are, are undergoing on a regular basis and determine that they meet the, the needs of, of what the community is, is, is doing. So on a Dr. County, under the leadership of uh, our district attorney, Bill Fitzpatrick, uh, committee's been formed to to come up with a plan. And then uh, the executive order requires each municipality as well to also uh, uh, have a plan. So what's gonna happen in this process is the county as a whole will, will come up with a plan and then each municipality will take that plan, maybe tweak it a little bit, look at, okay, is the needs of us, Baldwin's all the same as maybe Manlius or Camillus, maybe they are, maybe they aren't. Um, so uh, Mike Shepard, uh, one of the village uh, trustees, uh, he and I are going to be uh, co-chairs of our committee, and we've 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 got some people that we're going to uh, put on our committee to, to to evaluate those things. We're probably going to put a survey up on our website or through our Facebook page for people to uh, to to get back and let us know uh, types of things that they're looking for for the police department to to be engaged in. You know, as I read that executive order, and then they sent out about 135 page guideline book. Um, that, that we should be looking at. And I've read the whole thing. Much of that we're already doing, I'm very pleased to say. Some of the things that we're involved in, the training we've had our officers undergo, whether it be uh, de-escalation, whether it be dealing with individuals suffering from mental crisis, whether it be uh, 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 racial bias training, uh, those types of things. We've already done a lot of that and plan to do more. So uh, some of those things, I hope that we're a little bit ahead of the curve on uh, our policy on use of force is, is public. Uh, it's public. It's posted on our web page. If you'd like to review it, uh, feel free to do so. And uh, so that is a process that over the next few months, because by April 1st, uh, the village has to forward their plan to the office of the budget for New York State. So we will have a plan written and in place. Uh, and, and it, we have to invite public comment as well. So it'll be an opportunity for the public to come in and comment. So uh, there'll be more in the, in the weeks ahead that we publicize about that. But I just did want to get that message out as well, that that is something that, uh, that we're going to be undergoing. Uh, for me, uh, do I think it's going to uh, change wholesale changes to the way we operate? No, I don't think it's going to be wholesale changes to the way the Village of Balls of Police operates because we've been a a community service-based police department for nearly 50 years. That's our motto, and, and it's certainly not going to change uh, uh, while I'm the chief. At least that's my plan. But do I think it's an opportunity for us to uh, do a, a self-analysis and, and get some impact in, in, in input from the community and have an opportunity for us to improve and to grow and to better serve our community? I sure hope so. And if that's uh, the, the outcome, then I think it's going to be a successful one for us. So uh, I'm looking forward to uh, to this process, and uh, and and I just want to make sure that the public is aware of it, and uh, we'll we'll spread the word as as much as we can as we move forward. I was gonna. I thought about that when you mentioned the survey on the website, and your Facebook page. You know, there's a lot of groups within Baldwinsville who have uh, different reaches, maybe than the police department. So if you let if you make us aware when that survey is out there. There's a lot of residents that can help spread that so that more, you know, more community members and um, 
residents can see it and, and give you that input. But but I agree, you know, based on what I heard through the course of community service um, policing, it does seem a lot between you and the mayor and the talks that we've had that you guys hit on a lot of those key things. But it's never bad to take a, a self-reflection, right? See how well, see you where you can improve. I agree 100%. And, and I know there's been some, you know, some grumblings about this process and is it needed? And, and you know, the fact of the matter is the governor issued the executive order. It's something that needs to be done. And so I just look at it as an opportunity for us to uh, improve our relationship with the community. That's always been our goal is, is to have community input and uh, and for us to be a reflection of the community and the community's values. Normally that's done through the village board, those elected leaders. And then uh, whether it be a, a talk to the Rotary Club that, that, that I do on, on a regular basis or talks to other groups or we have uh, uh, scouting groups, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts come in and, and do tours. Obviously, much of that has been limited due to, due to COVID, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm talking in the past and, and over time, and, and it's not uncommon for me to meet someone and them say, geez, when I was seven or eight, we got brought in and put the jail cell in there. And I remember that, you know, because we do have our old jail cells in the police department from, they were installed in the late 1800s, as a matter of fact, but, uh, um, and the kids remember that. And, you know, these are guys in, or gals that are in their twenties or thirties now, but, uh, you know, those types of things to, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, people are talking now where well, you got to make those deposits in the community and build those relationships. I think we've been doing that for an awful long time. Does it mean that we can't improve? Absolutely not. Always looking for ways that, that we can improve, be more responsive uh, to our community. And, uh, you know, I look at an example is we have a, what we refer to as a, as a step program, selective traffic enforcement program. And traditionally what we do there is uh, there are streets that we are well aware of that problems persist on, whether it be a stop sign issue at Curtis and Brooks or Tappan and Canton Street, or whether it be speeding vehicles on Smoky Hollow Road or Canton Street um, or, or some other issue. Uh, we're well aware of that. So we will detail officers to, to patrol and, and park and, and monitor those, those locations for a specified period of time. But the other thing we do is we have the flexibility that if we have two or three calls from maybe somebody over on Phillips Street that, hey, I'm getting a lot of track tractor trailers that are driving down my street in violation of the five ton weight limit, we can modify that. So we can respond to citizen complaints and say, can we have an officer sit in your driveway? And almost nine times out of ten, they're like, absolutely. You know, I live, I live at such and such. OK, great. And the officer will then sit in the person's driveway and monitor the situation and, and hopefully take some action. And then uh, on that particular issue, um, they're not drivers that are local. So we'll work with those businesses that are outside the village and those, uh, you know, transportation directors at those locations. And please try and educate the drivers that are coming in not to come through the village just because of the, the, the problem with the no one, excuse me, wants a, you know, a massive tractor trailer rumbling past your house. So. Um, you know, if you're not on one of the state routes, they're 48, 370 or, or 31. So um, those are types of things that, that we try and do. Again, solve the problem, be responsive to citizens, um, all those types of things that, uh, that that we do. But again, I just look at this as an opportunity to improve, to grow as an organization and to be as responsive as, as possible to the community. Uh, that's what we're here for, quite frankly. Right. No, and I, and I agree, and I, I think it's great, and hopefully the community gives you a lot of input so that at the, at the end of the process, it's even a better relationship than you have with them right now. That's, that's, that's my hope as well. That's my hope as well. So um, I just, uh, you know, and, and some of the input, you know, might not be realistic for based upon what we do, and we'll talk about that as we move forward, and I'll comment on some of those things. You know, maybe we're limited by size or resources um, or capabilities. Uh, I've already, uh, you know, expressed to the village board one improvement I want to see for our, our police department is for all of our officers to have body cameras. We have in-car cameras. We've had in-car cameras for, I don't know, 20 years now. But uh, I think the next logical step for us is to have all of our outfit officers outfitted with body cameras. Um, that way, if there's a question, uh, hopefully it'll be have been captured by that body camera. They're not infallible. They're not... 100% accurate. They've got some limitations with their usage, but I think it would be beneficial for us to have them rather than not having them. So as I look at our organization, how can we improve? That's an area that we can improve in, without a doubt in my mind. So, um, you know, I'm already aware of some things that 
uh, we want to move forward with as well. And uh, I think it makes us more accountable to the community and I'm sure the community would ask for it. So I think uh, we might as well just get right out in front of it. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. Um, and I mean, there's almost cameras everywhere, um, like you said, in cars. And I think that came up when we were talking maybe in May or June, you know, and, they, and, so and the public had asked if you guys had those or not. So I yeah. think here like, the community would, for your safety, for the community safety, for just, you know, what truly happens at stops, you know, takes away some of the, maybe some of the problems that we've had at other parts of the country. Yes. Yeah. 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 I think that, you know, the greater level of accountability, you know, at the end of the day, we're, we're, we're a public service organization. That's what we are at the end of the day. Uh, we just happen to be involved in the law enforcement aspect of public service. That's what we do. Uh, so um, we, you know, we, we have got to have the public support in order for us to operate. Uh, do I think we have the public support? I believe we do. I think the, 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 the public is supportive of our organization and our mission and what we try and do and, and be visible and be there and, and try and uh, let our village residents and our school community and our students feel as safe as possible while either they're home or they're away from home or they come into the village and work or they come here and go to school or they walk to school or they bus to school. However, that that, that transpires, uh, our goal is to hopefully provide that, that level of safety and security for individuals to prevent as much crime as we possibly can. And for that crime that does occur, to actively investigate that and hopefully uh, uh, solve the case and find the perpetrators and uh, deal with that. So again, it doesn't happen again. That's our goal. Um, are we always successful? No, uh, nobody's going to bat a thousand. Nobody's going to be hundred percent successful, but your, your goal is to try and be as, you know, proactive as you can be and, um, to, to not let, uh, anything be, a, a, a from lack of effort that a case isn't solved or that we're not on a patrol. Or if somebody, if you as a village resident go away for a week or two on vacation, you know, we're going to check your home and I'm going to send you a letter to let you know how many times we went to your house. So again, there's that accountability there. So as the officers are assigned those house checks, they know at the end of the day, that house check's gonna end up on my desk because I'm gonna sign it. And I'm gonna look and say, okay, that person was gone for X number of days. I expect it to have been checked Y number of times. And uh, and, and it is. And uh, But if there's a situation where it's not, inevitably I'm gonna ask the sergeant and say, geez, how come the officer didn't, didn't check this? I thought it might get got checked a couple more times. And, uh, you know, maybe they were training or maybe they called in sick a day or they got busy with a couple things and uh, on a call. And so it's, there's something explainable away, but it was not because they just forgot about it and didn't want to do it. So mm -hmm. even down to that level of a house check and us sending you a letter, you know how many times your house was checked. You know, it's not like, geez, I know the police came and they checked it you know from us exactly how many times because I'm going to send you a letter telling you that. <laughs> well, now that I live in the village, I can't go anywhere. You know, there's a place to go. But as soon as I travel, I will let you guys know because I was kind of excited that my house can get looked at while, while I'm gone. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 you know, I, I, had, I had a person sit literally about two feet from where I'm sitting now because I'm sitting in front of my desk as, as compared to behind it today. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, if I'm not going to name the street he lives on, but you know, he and his wife go away every winter and he came in and was talking to me and he said, you know, to know that I've got a police officer coming to my house and checking that house. He goes, I can't tell you what that means to me. He goes, that's worth every nickel that I pay in taxes as far as I'm concerned, my peace of mind. So, mm -hmm. you know, and he's in an area where he's got neighbors, he's got people that obviously are going to be watching, but, you know, he just felt that that was uh, uh, very beneficial to him. And, and again, that's a, that's a service that we don't have to provide, but we think we should provide because uh, it's a level of service that our village residents have come to expect. There's no reason we can't provide that to them. And, uh, and, and, and so we are. So I look at those types of things uh, is, is, is positive and beneficial to our community. And, to, and again, just like our school resource officers, how can our department be a resource to the community? Um, you know, when we look at traffic safety issues and, and, uh, and, and those types of things, our goal is, is accident prevention. There's a direct correlation between the number of accidents that occur, number of people that are injured to traffic enforcement. So if we're enforcing vehicle traffic laws and specifically those aggressive driving behaviors, talking on your cell phone, speeding, fair to yield the right of way, uh, going through stop signs or stop lights, those major accident contributors uh, if we can enforce those and hopefully reduce the number of accidents and the number of people injured, plus 
in our village, as you know, Shelly, we've got a lot of people that walk around this village. Mm -hmm. The village has, has put a lot of money, time and effort into the infrastructure. I know there's been a sidewalk program going on for years and years now. And, um, the, you know, there's the, the, our village is very, very walkable. And a lot of people take advantage of that. So we will, again, try and be a resource. How can we make our village as safe as possible for our pedestrians to really do what we want them to do? Park their car and then walk around. Go check out the parks, stop in, get something to eat somewhere, uh, uh, walk up and down the trails. Uh, I think it's a, it's a great place for, for people to come and, and visit. So our goal is to, again, just try and be a resource and a, and a positive, positive aspect for a community. No, I agree. And I think you guys do a great job. So, Thanks. well, I appreciate your time. And, um, and even though it was only three weeks, I think we covered a lot of information, just general, which is what we talked about. Just, you know, some yeah. general information that maybe people don't know. So, Absolutely. well, I will look forward to talking to you in November when hopefully the snow has not flown yet. <laughs> yes. Yes. Hopefully we're just dealing with leaves, not, not, okay. not, not snow. And you know where I live. Uh, so, you know, I'm going to have a lot of leaves to deal with. You're going to have a lot of leaves. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right, talk to you soon, Chief. Thank you. All right, bye for now. Bye.